morning, church. I was here last week to hear John, and uh, he made an announcement about Vacation Bible School, and mine is very similar to what he had to say. I thought our Vacation Bible School this year was wonderful, and I especially appreciated uh, getting to know the children and uh, interacting with them throughout that week. And the ladies who prepared a supper for us each evening, uh, that was marvelous for us. As you know, we live quite a distance away, and the opportunity for B and I to sit with uh, John and Beth and have a little fellowship was really a good thing as well. If you have your Bible today, turn there to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're reading just the first three verses. 1 Peter chapter 2, and reading verses 1 through 3. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up into your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. You may be seated. Got to remember to turn my microphone on because I may not stand still today. I have a friend of mine named Ron Yannick who told me a story a number of years ago, and I want to share that story with you uh, before I get into the message today. He was in the Navy, and he was going to be shipped out of New York City to some foreign destination, I don't remember where, and the Navy was going to put him up in in lodging up in New York City on Saturday night, and then Sunday night he had to report to the ship. Uh, first thing on Monday morning. So he got to New York City on Saturday, got his hotel, uh, picked up the daily newspaper, and he was looking through the newspaper with the intention on Sunday morning to go to Marble Collegiate Church. He had always wanted to hear Dr. Norman Vincent Peale speak. So he's reading the newspaper, and he sees that Dr. Peale is out in San Francisco doing some speaking out there, he knows that he is not going to be at the Marble Collegiate Church on Sunday morning, and so he decides to bag it. He's just not going to go to church. If Dr. Peel isn't going to be there, he's not going to go there either. So he, he skips church on Sunday morning, does something else and whatever, and later in the day, he finds out that he missed Peter Marshall, who was speaking at the Marble Collegiate Church. Now, Peter Marshall was a well-known Christian pastor, author, and chaplain of the United States Senate for many, many years. And Ron told me, the Lord taught me a very valuable lesson that day. You don't go to church because of who the speaker is. You go to church to worship the Lord. And whoever the speaker is, is whoever the speaker is. And that's not why you've gone. It has come to my attention that some of you attend more regularly when I'm here than when John is here. That's not a good thing. That doesn't flatter me and it doesn't flatter the church and it doesn't flatter the Lord at all to do that. So enough said, you heard my story, you might get Peter Marshall instead. First Peter chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3 tell us this marvelous story, this unfolding of this text that Peter has shared with the church and with us. And he uses some very familiar language there. He tells us that there are several things that we need to do. We need to get rid of all kinds of deceit and malice, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. For the Christian, that those things should never be a part of who we are. We should not be deceitful. We should not have malice. We should not have hypocrisy. We should not have envy. We should not slander against others. A number of years ago, I encountered a man at the church where I was serving at the time out in the community, and I invited him to come to the church where I was uh, serving, and he said, I can't go to that church. And I said, why is that? He said, it's just full of hypocrites. And I said, well, you come on in. We have room for one more. (laughs) We are all hypocritical at times. We are all deceitful at times. We all have malice in our heart at times. But that should not be the testimony of our lives. 
What should be the testimony of our lives is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and how we live and walk and have being with him. Malice, the working of evil, is a horrible thing. To say unkind things about another person, to treat them with evil. I read an article yesterday that a man who is an avowed atheist and a historian has finally understood what has improved society through the years. You know, 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, if you were a slave, you could be treated or mistreated according to your slave master. You could be punished, you could be, have your fingers cut off, you could have all kinds of horrible things done to you and you had no choice in the matter. You had no say in the matter. That began to change. And so this avowed atheist who is a historian wondered why were these sudden changes coming? Why were things improving societally? His only conclusion was because of the Lord, because of the Christian church because of our needing to treat people in accordance with God's word, not with malice, not with envy, not with slander, not with hypocrisy, not with any of those kinds of things. Yes, all of us get caught up in that every once in a while. All of us, when we're driving down the highway and someone pulls in front of us and then slows down, we all want to shake our fist at them. Hopefully that's just a passing moment for us and not the way that we live our lives. Dale didn't mention up, up here that he and Bonnie were involved in an automobile accident yesterday. Uh, I don't know this, but I do know this. Dale and Bonnie did not get angry and shout at the young lady who had hit them. They did not curse at her. They didn't do any of those kinds of things because that's not in their character. I know that without even asking that question. Were they happy that it happened? Of course not. They're both a little stiff and sore today. They're grateful that the front end of the car where the motor is located was what was hit instead of the passenger door. They're very fortunate in that regard. We, d we have to be the testimony with our, of our lives needs to be the grace, the love, and the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ for us. Peter says to us, therefore, because of all the things that we've read there in chapter 1, therefore, rid yourself of all of these things, of the deceit, the hypocrisy, the envy, the slander of all of these kinds of things. And then he tells us, be like newborn babies, craving the pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up into your salvation. B and I haven't had babies in our home for a long time, except when the grandchildren visit. And we love those moments. We're weary by the time they leave, if they're there for an hour, we're tired. If they're there all day, we're tired. If they're there over the night, we're still tired. There's a reason God generally gives children to people who are younger than what we are. But we love when they come. We have out on our back deck some cats and kittens who visit us regularly. B feeds them. She's developed a relationship with two of them. We claim that the mice population has diminished. As well as she feeds them, they're not eating mice, I can promise you that. They're eating other things other than mice. And one of them has a kitten. And I love to watch that kitten and its mother interact. And they'll, they'll bat about at each other and paw at each other and all those kind of things. And then finally mom will lay down and the kitten will nurse from mom. There's nothing sweeter than seeing a nursing cat nursing from its mother, or a nursing calf, or a nursing deer, or whatever it might be, craving that pure milk that comes from mom. And for us, it's the pure milk, the spiritual milk, that comes from the Lord. God wants us to receive nutrition by reading his word, by understanding his word, by devouring his word, so that we can grow up in our salvation, so that we are not the same person as what we were when we came to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior so that we are growing into the meat of the gospel. You know, I like milk. I drink a glass of milk every day, and Bob, it's not oat milk either for me. <laughs> I think we're inventing things. We have almond milk and oat milk and all. 
I, I drink milk every evening. I drink a glass of milk. Now, I drink that, uh, I forget what it's called now, but it has twice the amount of protein and half of half a mind. Of, no, that's me, half a mind about it, you know. I like a good glass of milk, but I tell you what, I like a good T-bone steak or a strip steak or something like that. I don't want to just drink milk for my nutrition in life. I want a few other things to go along with that. We need to move from milk to meat. We need to be devouring the Word of God. We need to be studying and investing our lives and spending our time and energy and efforts in there so that we can grow up in our salvation. And then he says, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. I want to re remind you of a verse of scripture. I'm going to walk around. I can't stand still this morning. In fact, I'm going to walk down here with you. I'll have to climb back up these steps at a moment. I don't know whether the camera can see me or not, but I'm not worth looking at anyhow if you're watching on camera. Just listen. Maybe that's enough for you today. Psalm 34, 8. Does someone have that? Someone want to look that up for me? Psalm 34 and verse 8. Whoever has it, just read it for me. Psalm 34 and verse 8. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Psalm 34 while you're looking it up. Psalm 34 is written as an acrostic. There are 22 verses in Psalm 34. Each of those begins with a, the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Num, Samek, Ayin, Pe, Sade, Kof, Reis, Shin, Sin, Tav. 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Each verse begins, for us it would be like the letter A, and then the next verse the letter B, and the next verse the letter C. So verse 8, who has Psalm 34, verse 8? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Okay, Don, thank you for that. Don, is there any food that you have ever tasted that was really good, but it didn't look very good? Can you give me an example? Something comes to your mind. I'll, I'll let the rest of you think about this as well. Sauerkraut. Tastes good, doesn't look good. Someone else have an example. Something that tastes good, but doesn't look good. I'm sorry? Okay, steamed crabs. I think they kind of look good, too, but that, that's probably just my warped thinking there. Whatever. Dale posted one time on the Internet, it, don't try to eat a bowl of tapioca while you're watching Dr. Pimple Popper. <laughs> I, I think tapioca looks awful. I like the taste of it, but I generally don't eat a lot with my eyes closed, you know, I... I have trouble enough getting it in my mouth sometimes and not wearing it on my shirt. Someone else have a, have a food that doesn't look good but tastes good. Mountain oysters. <laughs> Amen to that, sister. <laughs> if you don't know what that is, we'll give a class on that someday, but it won't be today. <laughs> there are some things... I, I, the other one I thought about was Scrapple. Uh, I don't eat Scrapple anymore. I, I finally realized you probably shouldn't eat something that has crap in the middle. <laughs> Just saying. It certainly doesn't look very good, but it does taste good. I remember having eaten that many times as a kid growing up and all of that sort of thing. Now, have you ever eaten something that really looked good but didn't taste good. Having done more than 600 weddings in my career, I have eaten an awful lot of wedding cake that looked really pretty. Yeah, you got it. It didn't taste so good. They make it for looks and not for taste. Now, I love a good piece of cake or a piece of pie or same as anyone else, I suppose, but some of that with that fondant icing and all that sort of thing. Looks good. And if you had some oat milk, you could probably swallow it down, Bob. <laughs> it just doesn't taste good. But when you get that wonderful combination of something that looks good and tastes good, it's good to the eye, it's good to the mouth, it's good for your soul. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
God doesn't just taste good. The scripture is like honey to my soul. Isn't that what it tells us in Proverbs? It doesn't just taste good. The Lord is beautiful. He is beautiful beyond description. Can you imagine what it's like to see God seated high and holy on his throne like Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter 6? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord seated high and holy on his throne. And I cried out, woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people with unclean lips. And then the seraphs flew from the angel, from the throne of God, these seraph angels flew, and they had six wings, with two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they did fly. And they cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah knew he was done. He has these unclean lips. Who of us doesn't? Who of us doesn't have unclean lips? I didn't see many hands going up in the air. We all do. We've all said things that we have regretted or things that slipped out of our mouth. Little boy had a lawnmower out in front of his house, and he was, had it, a little for sale sign on it. There was a new pastor in town, and he's walking down the street, and he sees this little boy with a lawnmower, and he says, son, how much do you want for that lawnmower? He said, five hours. Pastor said, five hours? That lawnmower ought to be worth a whole lot more than five hours. And, and the little boy said, well, you have to pull in that handle and pull in that handle and pull in that handle until it'll finally start. And sometimes it won't start. He said, I found out if you curse a little bit, <laughs> it helps you. And the pastor said, son, I haven't cursed in years. He said, you pull in that handle enough, it'll come back to you. All of us have said something that we didn't want to say. We need our lips touched. When Isaiah has this vision in chapter 6, the angel flies over to the altar of God and with a pair of tongs takes a, a coal from it and flies back and he touches Isaiah's lips. He purifies him. He prepares him for the mission and the message that God wants him to preach. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I want you to understand that our world is full of trouble. There's a lot of evil in our world and it's not getting better. The Lord tells us it's not going to. We shouldn't be a bit surprised by that. It's not getting better. It's getting continually worse. And the only way that I know of that we can remove ourselves from that is by putting ourselves into the presence of the Lord. By spending time reading, studying, and meditating upon his word. By listening to good things, to good music. By hearing good messages. By focusing on what the Lord is and what he has done. I challenge you with this. Whenever you feel a little bit down in the dumps, and all of us do at times, take a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil and begin writing down the blessings that the Lord has given to you. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. See how many you have on your list. I promise you, your attitude will be better when you're done with that list than it was when you started it. Because you will be reminded of the things that the Lord has done for you. And won't be just focused on the problems that are surrounding you. There were two little boys. They were friends. One of them was from a wealthy family and the other one was far from wealthy. 
And one day, a guy in town comes to the little boy who's, who's wealthy and says, I'm going to take you to the candy store and open it up for you. Whatever is in there, you can eat as much as you want as many things as you want. And he tells the little boy who's not from the wealthy family, you come along with me also. And so he drops the little boy off. And the little boy goes inside. He said, I'll come back after a while. And he takes the the boy from the not wealthy family and he takes him down to a stable and says, son, there's a whole bunch of horse manure in here that I need you to shovel out of this barn for me. And you just shovel it and put it in this wheelbarrow and wheel it out here beside the barn, out in the field there, and you just dump it out there. The little boy said, okay. So the fella goes to check on the boy in the candy store. And he gets to the candy store, and he, he sees the little fellow in there, and he says, well, how much candy have you eaten? He said, I haven't eaten anything. Everything in this store you can have. Anything in this store you can have. As much of it as you want, you can have. You didn't eat anything? He said, no, sir. Why didn't you? He said, I'm afraid if I eat candy, my teeth will get rotten and I'll have to go to the dentist. The fellow said, okay, well, come with me. And they walk on down the ways until they find this barn where the little boy's in there shoveling horse manure into a wheelbarrow and hauling it out to the field and dumping it out there. And this little boy is just smiling and laughing and having a great time. And the guy said, you, you've almost got this whole barn emptied. He said, yes, sir, I did. He said, and you have a smile on your face and joy in your heart. What gives? He said, with all this manure here, there has to be a pony somewhere. Taste and see that the Lord is good. If we spend all of our time, energy, and effort just complaining about things, and no time at all rejoicing, guess what's going to happen to us? Our life is going to go down and down and down. I need someone else to look up a... Two verses of scripture for me. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verses 19 and 20. When you have them, I want you to just call them out to me. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verses 19 and 20. Who has it? Is that 29 or 30? Oh, it was 31. Okay. Chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. We'll wait for you. I have set before you life and death. It's up to us what we choose. Joy or heartache. It's up to us what we choose. I have set before you good and evil. It is up to us what we choose. We know that the world chooses the negative side of things every time. And sometimes we get affected by that or afflicted by that. We need to choose life. We need to choose the Lord. That's what he's saying there in verse 1 to us. We need to have the choice of not speaking malice, not living with envy or anger, not living in any of those kinds of things. It is our choice. If someone does you wrong, 
it's our normal reaction to want to do wrong back to them. Just on the way down here today, a car out on the interstate sped up past me. I was in the right lane. Doesn't happen very often, but I was in the right, I was in the right lane. <laughs> sped up past me, pulled it in front of me, and then slowed down. So I got into the left lane, and I sped up ahead, got back to my normal speed, and I said to B, I'm really tempted to pull in front of him and slow down. You know, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. We learned that in physics class. I didn't do that, but that was my temptation. One child slaps another child. Guess what the second child's going to do to the first one? Slap them back. Of course, I will tell you, it's the second slapper who always gets caught. Yeah, the first one gets away with it every time. So if you're going to slap somebody, be the first one. No, that's not. The <laughs> we need to choose. When Moses is writing here in Deuteronomy, he says... There is set before you this choice, life and death. Choose life. I visited with my good friend Joe Zimmerman in the hospital this week. He's in Lancaster General Hospital. He's been a pastor in our conference for a long time. He's older than me, but I ordained him into the ministry. We've been good friends for a long time. He's 80 years of age. He had a an aortic aneurysm that was a quarter of an inch in size, which is huge. They told him he had 0% chance of living if he didn't have the surgery. That was what he wanted, was just to not have the surgery. His wife said, we're voting differently than that. <laughs> he said, yes, ma'am. So he had the surgery, and the surgery went fine. And, of course, they, they split your sternum in the open heart surgery. Veda would know this better than me, but they split your sternum and they wire it back together. Well, sometime about a week or so later, inadvertently, in his sleep, he went to roll over and when he did, he cracked his sternum, broke it in five places. They had to go back in and put plates and screws in. Every time they give him anesthesia, he struggles with that in, in lots of ways. Joe is a brilliant man. He has a Ph.D. in viral oncology. He worked in the medical field for years. He was a professor at a, at a medical school, and then he was a, a, a designer of pharmaceuticals for one of the big pharmaceutical companies. And then the Lord got a hold of him. When he was 53 years of age, he went into seminary. I had the privilege of knowing him and, and loving him and ordaining him. He now has developed pneumonia in his one lung. I was there on Thursday when they injected him with a needle and withdrew almost a liter of fluid from his lung. He said to me before they took him to that procedure, I don't think I'm going to see you again. I think I'm going to die before, before this procedure is over. And I said, well, you can believe what you want to believe, but that's not what I'm believing. I believe I'm going to see you again here in this room in an hour's time. He said, good luck on that. He was, he was downtrodden. He was broken. Joe is normally a very optimistic man, but he's been through a lot in the last several weeks. And so I prayed with him before he went. Well, he came back to the room. He said, I guess you were right after all. I said, mark it down, Carolyn. I don't get credit for being right very often. I understand when you're, when you're troubled, when your heart hurts, when your soul hurts, when you've lived in pain, when others have not treated you well, even though you have treated them well. I understand the knee-jerk reaction of wanting retribution for some harm that has been done to you pulling in front of somebody and putting your brakes on 
Well, guess what happens when you do that? It's probably going to escalate. It's probably not a good end to that kind of thing. But I understand that. But choose life. Choose the good things that the Lord puts in front of you. Choose to read his word and to pray. And you know, God isn't interested in you praying like we pray on Sunday morning. I mean, yeah, if that's how you pray, that's fine. But he's really interested in you just having conversation with him. In fact, one of the things that I recommend to people who are new to the faith particularly, they say, well, pastor, I, don't, I, I don't really don't know how to pray. I say, do you know how to talk? Yeah, sure, I know how to talk. Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to set a kitchen chair right here, and I want you to set another kitchen chair right over here. And you sit in one of those chairs, and you just imagine Jesus is sitting in the other chair. And you just have conversation. Tell him about your day. Tell him what joys you have in your life. Tell him your frustrations. Tell him everything. And just think of him sitting in that chair. That, my friends, is prayer. Talk with him as you're driving down the highway. Keep your eyes open. But talk with him as you're driving down the highway. Talk with him as you're walking daily in your life. Then you know what the scripture says? Teach these statutes unto your children, even as you walk on the highways and byways of life. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Peter has had a message of counsel and encouragement for us. And finally, Jesus says this. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome this world. Friends, I don't know what it is that you might be facing in your life. Whether it's a spiritual issue, a physical issue, a relationship issue, any of those kinds of things. Choose life. Take it to the Lord and pray. Sit in that chair opposite him and have that conversation with him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you this day for who you are. Thank you that you love us and are concerned for us. Thank you that you walk with us always. Oh Lord, today if there's someone here who's struggling with an issue, be it physical, relationship, emotional, spiritual, mental, whatever it might be, Lord, today help them to choose life. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the love that you have shown us through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.